Well, Dylan, thanks so much for being here. I'm excited to chat with you. Um, I think, first of all, because this is the first time that we've actually connected and I'm looking forward to learning more about your background and, and how you're helping to reshape the running world because you're doing some really cool things. So welcome. Thank you so much, Jason. Really appreciate the intro and the invitation to come on your show as a frequent listener to Strength Running. It's uh, it's great to be here. So thanks for the invite. Well, I was doing my homework for this and I learned that you like IPAs. So I'm a little disappointed we couldn't be sitting around a, a table having a beer recording this. Yeah. Well, I had a couple last night emerging from sober January, which we do every single year. I met a friend and somebody who's sort of in the free trail orbit down the road and had a couple of Pliny's last night, but it's now 10 o'clock in the morning for our listeners on a Thursday morning. So it's not quite IPA hour yet. No, not quite. And you didn't waste any time because yesterday was February 1st. So after dry January, you were right back on the wagon. Yeah, back on the wagon. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've always been a hyper social person who really enjoys going out having a couple frosty cold ones watching sports etc but actually this may be fun to talk about I'm sort of moving into a period of my life where I don't have a lot of space to do that anymore you know just sort of like the IPAs while they still go down really easily they definitely don't um, yeah, they don't treat me like they used to when I was younger and uh, now as a new father, a small business owner, someone who's trying to be an athlete and a good husband at the same time. Yeah, the uh, the five percent performance reduction that I experience after two or three IPAs is something I can't really afford anymore. So I'm trying to really reduce my alcohol consumption. This yeah, this is a good topic. Let's yeah. go off script and, and chat about this for a few minutes, because I feel like we're in very similar phases of life a little bit. I mean, you're a little bit earlier on with things, but you just had a baby a few months ago. I think your your kid is five or six months now. And you moved, you're starting this business. And, and you're right, you know, like, there's just less space for all those other things when you're focusing so hard on the big things, the big things that you actually really care about. Um, and I have certainly found that I don't drink the way that I used to. You know, if you go back and, and look at my college years, maybe the five years post-college, uh, it might be slightly concerning. You might want to call the authorities. But now, now that I'm well into my 30s, I, I like to say that even though I'm 39, I'm yeah. in my 30s, uh, <laughs> I yeah. can't drink the way that I used to. Man. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. And uh, alcohol has probably been too big of a part of my life for too long of a time. I was definitely like an obnoxious partier in my college days. And like I said, just being like a super hyper extroverted person who loves to go out and socialize and watch sports and hang out with people, develop relationships. Alcohol is just like, obviously the perfect social lubricant. And it's uh, become a... Uh, maybe too much of a part of my, my social identity. And I mean, I've never had a problem with it. I should say that off the front. And there are a lot of people who do and who, you know, that that's never been something that I struggled with, but it's more now thinking about ways in which I can enter this new chapter of my life and perform at a level that I'm proud of. And in order to do that, it's become clear that I need to make some sacrifices and really the alcohol thing and going out and doing the stuff that I used to do when I was younger is like the most obvious thing that I should and need to sacrifice. But actually, you know, we've been actually doing a, a partnership with Free Trail with a new like NA beer company. And these new non-alcoholic beers are so good. And so that has really helped me not only with sober January, but with the overall reduction of alcohol intake. So anyway, it's, yeah. uh, it's front of mind for me right now. So it's fun to kind of, yeah, go off script and riff about it for a little while. Yeah. With the NA beers that are out now, we've just come such a long way from the days of O'Doul's and right. the worst non-alcoholic beer you've ever had. Um, but, you know, what you said really resonates with me because, you know, first of all, we probably would have been best friends in college. I, I think uh, we both would have been uh, really fun. But with that said, it, it's really interesting to me because, you know, a lot of the things that 
we talk about on our respective podcasts is peak performance and and speaking with really high level athletes and talking about some of the things that they do to get to those levels of performance. And so I'm always been really interested in optimization. You know, how do you get faster? How do you do things better? And and it's always been in stark contrast to my love for going out for a couple beers because you're not optimizing anything except maybe your social life yeah. when you're going out there to have a couple drinks and you know, when we're talking about any of the recovery strategies that are super popular today or the importance of getting your sleep, all of that is sort of thrown out the window as soon as you have a couple of those IPAs. So yeah. now that I'm getting a little older, it's certainly something that I need to weigh much more heavily because I, I need that extra 5% for performance every day, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I should say that I slept absolutely terribly last night after having two Pliny's. So it, the stark realization of yeah, just like how much it does impact me was staring me in the face this morning. I went running with a friend for about an hour and a half this morning and got to say I didn't feel great. But it actually brings up another point. I was speaking to somebody who's sort of become one of my unofficial media mentors and he, i was lamenting the fact that my running career has also really been sacrificed or has taken a back seat to everything else that i have going on and he said something to the effect of you can't simultaneously be a good dad a small business owner and a pro athlete at the same time especially with a child as young as mine and as i'm really trying to not compromise on my running anymore and at least make sure I make time for it again because it's something that I really have sacrificed. Of course, that means that there's something else in order to create that space. Like I really need to do that optimization to use your word and, and cut out all the other distractions of which alcohol intake is certainly one of them. Yeah, I think at this phase of where we're at in our life, I think cutting out the fat and really focusing on what is truly important is one of the big themes, I think, in in, our, in this phase of life. Um, but let's talk a little bit more about your background, because I'm, I'm really interested in how you got into running. So, you know, when I was in college, one of my good friends was the captain of the lacrosse team, and we had a lot of fun together. But I have to say, Dylan, I don't know too many lacrosse players who have then turned around and got into ultra trail running. Yeah. What was going through your brain maybe 15 years ago when you started thinking to yourself, I'm going to start going after such a vastly different sport than lacrosse? Yeah, well, honestly, I feel like the two sports really do complement each other. And I'll get around to explaining another idea that I have about how I might be able to bring the two things closer together later on in my career. But effectively, when I graduated from college and therefore my college lacrosse career came to an end, I was in a moment in my life where I was really confused as to what I wanted to do, what I wanted to devote myself to. And I've always been somebody who's thrived in sporting environments and who just gets the most joy out of that daily practice. You know, when I was in college, I wasn't that academic of a person. Going to practice was always the highlight of my life. Even going back to my high school, middle school days, it was like, I was never that interested in academic work. I was always interested in sports. In college, my role on the lacrosse team ended up evolving into basically being the hustle guy. You know, I was kind of known as being the runner on the team, even though I'd never had run cross country in, or track, even going back to when I was in grade school. And so that became sort of like my reputation, the guy with the big engine, the guy that hustled, the guy that made plays running up and down the field, et cetera. And so when I graduated and then emerged into this new chapter where I didn't, for the first time in my life, have the opportunity to go to practice every day, I started partying way too much to go back to our first conversation and quickly became unhappy with the person that I was sort of becoming. And then I was living in Aspen, Colorado at the time. And so I just started running. And because I was living in the Rocky Mountains, it became natural for me to just start running trails. So I never like really took the road marathoning, half marathoning 
circuit seriously or never really tried to reach my peak potential in that environment. Simultaneously, I grew up in Boulder, and so I've always been kind of like an outdoorsy person. And so the trail running community and the trail running sport really just fits me and my personality better than the road and track scene did. And so it really became clear, like, okay, this is something that I can actually use as to keep myself healthy, keep myself in shape, and to have that daily go to practice thing in my life to just go out and get a run in and use that to sort of, you know, for all the mental health benefits, stress relief, et cetera, and, and to not feel so bad about going out late night every night. <laughs> and then, of course, sort of like because I had been an athlete for my entire life and because I was sort of known as the hustle guy on my lacrosse team and I had sort of a natural talent for it, I got better and better so quickly. And then, of course, that becomes sort of like it creates momentum behind it and creates sort of like a a cycle to the upside where you see yourself improving. It becomes addicting. You want to do it more. Then you find out about racing. You start racing. You have decent performances. You see yourself getting better. You measure yourself against the competitors. And then all of a sudden I was like, wow, this is something that maybe could turn into something bigger than just sort of like a fun way to exercise. So that's sort of the long way of how I got into it. It was at a moment of sort of uncertainty and confusion in my life and really feel blessed now in retrospect that I fell into this community. I see a lot of parallels there with how I got started with running, but you know, I got started with cross country as a freshman in high school and quickly fell in love with, with all those same things, right? You start feeling some progress and you start racing and then you get better and you know, I was confused too. I almost went out for the golf team, Dylan. So I, my life could have been very, very different. <laughs> Great game. Great game. You'd have a yeah. sweet golf podcast at this point. Yeah. Strengthgolf.com. It would have been amazing. <laughs> Got to get that and URL. I know. I should check to see if that domain's open for, yeah. for a side gig. But um, I, I also really, it, it resonates with me when you talk about you were an athlete for such a long time that as soon as you graduated college and you didn't have to go to practice, you had this sort of emptiness where you weren't sure what to do and you started partying more. And when I was in my post-collegiate training years and, and I was, you know, I was running a lot. I was running 80, 85 miles a week when I was in my peak training, which, you know, a lot of people run a lot more than that. But for me, it, it felt like a lot. And I was doing it with a full-time job and I was getting up really early before work to do it. And I always kept wondering to myself, why am I doing this? I don't have to be doing this. I'm not going to let down my coach because I don't have one. I'm not going to let down my teammates. And, and there was a brief period where I moved into an apartment with five of my college friends. And, you know, it was very, very much of a fratty kind of environment where we were partying too much. And for about six weeks, I didn't really train. I didn't really run and I was partying way too much. And I got to say at the end of those six weeks, I didn't like who I was. I didn't like the way I felt. I didn't like the consistency of the partying and the fact that I didn't have the running to balance it out. So I, I think if anyone's listening who hasn't been consistent with their training, it can really give you such an anchor in your life that that really is a very powerful way to focus on something very positive and constructive in your life for sure. Yeah, it's funny. And this is part of what I've been thinking about a lot recently is I try to really recommit myself to consistency in my running with the hopes of eventually returning to high level competition in 2023 is just how much better I feel in life and as a person when I'm fit when I'm doing workouts, when I'm like feeling proud and exhausted and like have that deep sense of internal peace of like, man, I earned it today, you know? And so, and I, I think, you know, going back to, it's funny that we're talking so much about alcohol consumption and, and partying, but I have a, a dear friend named Yassine Daboon who's been sober for the last 18 years and speaks openly about his struggles with alcoholism when he was younger. But one of the things he's struck me or that struck me in a conversation with him was and we didn't talk about this earlier is that like alcohol really does have an impact on your mood too even though when you're out and you're drinking and you're having fun and you're socializing like that feels good but then the next day when you're hungover and stuff like I always sort of like have a lull in my mood too and so 
anyway, just like those two things always exist in confrontation, right? Like I feel so good when I'm fit and committed and training and simultaneously in order to feel fit and good and training, you have to avoid the things that are inherently depressive and that, you know, sort of thwart that progress and have inherent mood instability (laughs) consequences to them. So anyway, yeah, it's uh, running's a, a gift, and I'm so lucky to have found it when I did um, at that point in my life. What would you say to the person who might be listening to us talk, and, and they might be in a similar position as you were 15, 16 years ago? Um, you, you hadn't really gotten into ultra endurance trail running, um, but maybe you were thinking about it. What would you say to the person who might be thinking about it, and, and, and of course, you know, they're ultra curious, but they have a few dozen reservations about finally pulling the trigger and signing up for their first ultra. How would you, how would you speak to that person? You know, what I would say is that you don't need to do ultras. Like I I fancy myself, somebody who's a proselytizer of trail, not necessarily ultra, right? And this goes back to what I was hoping to get around to of something that has been in the back of my head that I'd love to do at some point in my career. But you asked sort of like how you go from the cross to ultra running. And I said, they actually complement each other really well. So one of the things that I would really love to do is identify people like me who are soccer players or field hockey players or lacrosse players who have that hustle guy or gal reputation on their team who have like a natural skill with just a big engine, but who also have that inherent athleticism that you develop as a field sport athlete. Because I think specifically for trail running, it becomes highly valuable where agility is something that is necessary when you're trying to navigate technical descents. And also just like having a little bit more of an athletic frame in some cases, I think it it comes a little bit more naturally probably to field sport athletes. And I think especially for ultra distance racing, having a little bit more of that athletic, strong strength running type frame uh, is beneficial to performance on the trails. And so that's sort of what I would say to people. Like if, if the question is, what would you say to people like me who are field sport athletes who are sort of figuring out what they want to do next and are a little bit curious about ultras first i would say you know get on trails you know try something shorter it doesn't need to be a 50k it doesn't need to be 100 miles the reason i went to ultras is because that's what genuinely motivated and inspired me when i learned about the leadville 100 it was like i'm doing that no question about it but there's a lot of the new generation now who come from um you know whatever athletic background and they have a lot more opportunity to sort of develop a little bit more slowly, start with the shorter distances. And then over time, if they feel motivated, move up to the longer stuff. So that's what I would say is like, you know, get on trails. That's what I care about. If you're motivated to do a hundred mile race or an ultra distance race of any distance, more power to you. You'll find that it's not as crazy as it sounds. And that, you know, with discipline, with training, just like anything else, you, you put your mind to it and you can do it. I want to echo what you said about choosing what genuinely interests you, what genuinely lights a fire underneath you, because I think that's the the magic sauce right there. That's the secret ingredient, if there is one, to successful running, right, is find something that actually lights that passion underneath you and, and really gets you motivated to to train, to commit, to really see what you can do, because that's where the the magic happens when you're actually so interested in something that it doesn't feel like work. It doesn't feel like you're, you have to do the training. You want to do the training because you're so invested in it because it's so interesting to you. And, you know, we might've been best friends from a party perspective in college, but I certainly think that there's some differences in like our approach to running and that I don't really have any interest in running a hundred miles, yeah. but you know, the shorter stuff is really interesting to me. And and trail running in general is something that I absolutely love. If I could just do all my running on trails, I I probably would just because it's so much more fun, but you've got to find what you actually enjoy doing. And only from there can then we talk about 
optimization or the training side of things and all those other things that I love talking about. But at the end of the day, we've got to love what we're doing first. No question about it. Yep. Totally agree. Um, now, Dylan, I want to talk about, speaking of doing scary things, uh, in the last two, maybe three years, you've really taken the whole running media by storm a little bit. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about free trail and, and the growth of your business over the last couple of years? Because you've certainly been uh, an inspiration to me as someone who's, who's been in the space for a little, a little while and seeing you come on and just do some awesome stuff. Well, well, thank you so much, first of all, for that endorsement of what we're doing. It means a lot, especially, you know, as somebody who's a big admirer of yours to hear that feedback. Um, thank you, first of all. That's great. And yeah, I mean, so it's taken a while for us to really figure out <laughs> what we're doing. And it's obviously still very much a work in progress. But to kind of give you a little bit more of the backstory, actually, in 2019, I had an absolutely horrible year, broke my ankle, was like super down in the dumps, depressed, ended up like hurting my Achilles, crashing my bike, separating my shoulder, getting a concussion. It was just like an absolute disaster of a year. And like any disaster, as you sort of emerge from the acute phase of it, you end up with a lot of valuable learnings. And one of those things for me was that running was not going to last forever. I had always had my personal identity wrapped up in my athletics, going back to lacrosse and even before. I mean, for as long as I can remember, I was always known as like kind of the sports dude, the guy who played football, the guy who played lacrosse, et cetera. And that's always been where I derived my friends, my relationships, popularity, trophies, success, identity, all those things. And I had been so lucky in my life to really never experience injury. And then this year where injury was just coming at me like an avalanche, it really confronted me for the first time of like, oh, dude, this is going to end someday. Like, you're not going to be able to derive your self-identity from being a pro athlete forever. So what are you going to do, you know? And I had always been, I mean, for as long as I can remember, you live in Colorado, right, Jason? Denver, Colorado. So I grew up in Boulder, like I said, and I grew up, my alarm clock every morning was a, sh a talk radio show called Lewis and Floor Wax, which is an old, I'm sure it doesn't exist anymore, an old sports talk radio show. And I listened to sports talk radio my whole life. And I've always dreamed of like having my own show. Now, of course, media evolves and now it's podcast, etc. So I'd always like wanted to start my own show. And because I got into trail running when I did, I feel like I was really fortunate in that I've just had a perfect place to observe this massive growth trajectory that the sport has been on. Of course, I've been able to cultivate a lot of experience and develop a lot of great relationships over time. And so it put me in a position to where when I started my show that like I had the relationships, I had the knowledge so that I, and, you know, be, I developed a reputation and, um, you know, a little bit of a stature within the community that I was able to develop an audience fairly quickly. And then of course, just like running, as you build consistency, you get better, you get addicted to it, you really enjoy it, and it builds some momentum. Eventually, I got connected with my great friend and, and business partner now named Ryan Thrower. And it was at that point where we started to think a little bit bigger of like, what could we do beyond just a podcast? And there were some things that happened personally and professionally at the time that I won't talk about publicly, but that really like made me think like, you know what, I am doing this stuff myself. I'm not going to rely on other people to tell the story. Like we're going to do this. And so that's kind of been the attitude that we've taken of just like, let's try, let's go for it. And we've definitely screwed a lot of things up. You know, we rebranded publicly, like totally sort of screwed up our initial kind of business model. We're still trying to figure out our business model. But, um, you know, for when you build something from scratch, it's like, man, I have learned more in the last two years than I have in the entirety of my academic career combined. And simultaneously, just like the early days of my running career, I am completely obsessed with it. Like, I cannot stop thinking about it. I love what I do. I feel like the sport 
is responding and like it's worth it and like the sport is deserves what we're trying to build granted we're a long way from success and there's a very good chance that it doesn't work out but you know so far it's been just an amazing mission for us and i guess just to kind of give your audience an idea of kind of what we do obviously we have sort of a my podcast called free trail podcast we have a second show called trail society we're going to be expanding that sort of like audio network we do video stuff we now do written publishing we have a fantasy platform we have an event up in oregon we do some e-commerce stuff so like it's really we just launched sort of a coaching product and so it's turning into this kind of big complicated i don't know phenomenon that branches into all these different kind of categories and sometimes i feel like maybe we're it's a little bit too complicated and we're losing focus on sort of the fundamentals, but overall, man, it's been just such an adventure and uh, yeah, just like such a learning experience. So the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is trying to build this, this little small business. And, you know, some days I'm like, what the heck am I doing? This is a complete waste of time. I'm completely incompetent. But then other times, after like, for example, the last quarter of 2022 was completely brutal, like just absolutely brutal, just slogging away, feeling like you're making no progress at all. And then at the end of the year, we had a couple small victories and it was like, oh, yes, you know, just that one little feeling of, okay, we're doing something here. And so, you know, that's the, the, those like glimmers of hope are very few and far between. I'm sure you can sympathize with a lot of the stuff I'm saying, but overall, like we feel like we're doing something that the sport deserves. And, you know, we feel like we're, we're developing our audience and our own voice and doing something in our own way. And, uh, it brings me a, a ton of joy. Yeah. I see a lot of parallels with, you know, what you're doing and what I was doing in 2012, 2013, 2014, starting strength running and, and growing that. And isn't it so interesting how there are also so many parallels with entrepreneurship and running, you know, listening to you talk about, oh, last quarter was a slog. And then finally, after being consistent, I had a couple victories and it's like, oh, it's worth it. And running is exactly the same way. You can have months of setbacks and, and, unfun training and then you have one good result and it's all worth it or even just one good workout and you're like yes, yeah okay like i don't suck <laughs> like that's kind of the mentality that uh, or a glimpse into my psychology at the end of 2022 is just like oh okay like we can breathe for a second and but still then the next week you're dealt another laundry list of things that you can totally stress out about for weeks on end. And it's, I think all about just, just like running, finding peace in that process and, and not really thinking about, okay, how are we going to get to some result in the future, but more just like, let's get better today. Let's focus on today. And over time, if you do that, you know, things compound and then you look back 10 years later and you think like, holy smokes, how did that happen? It's really interesting to compare the running media scene 10 years ago with where it is today, because 10 years ago, there really wasn't too much trail specific media content or, or even trail specific media companies. And, and now you can see not only is trail running being talked about on podcasts and video and the written word, but there's entire podcasts dedicated to the sport and you know, I've, I was struck by you saying, I think the trail running community deserves what we're doing. And maybe you can speak to a little bit about the evolution of the trail running world over the last five, 10 years, and, and specifically what you guys at, uh, that you're trying to do at uh, free trail. Yeah. So, okay. So the sport has been going through just a massive growth spurt since I got into it. So again, there's a lot, a lot of this is fortunate timing, right? Just right person, right place, right time. And because I got into the sport when I did again, like I've been able to sort of ride that wave in my athletic career, building relationships and experience along the way. And I think trail running occupies just a fascinating place in the global sporting landscape in that if you think about it from a business perspective, it's really the only sport in which 
brands like Solomon and the North Face are going to be competing against like Nike and Adidas and Lululemon, right? Like the outdoor meets performance element of the sport, I think makes it really, really interesting. Simultaneously, now with the advent and evolution of live streaming of races, we're able to really convey the spirit and beauty of our sport to a much larger audience. So for example, like the thing that got me curious about endurance sport was watching the broadcast of Ironman Kona as a kid. And back in those days, they just distilled it down to like a one hour highlight tape. Now they live stream the whole, you know, eight or nine hours of the event. And I think that as this starts to evolve in trail running, a similar thing is going to happen where people are going to see like, oh my goodness, Mont Blanc in France? What is UTMB? You go through Italy and Switzerland and back into France and you have this insane backdrop of the most beautiful mountain range in the, the entire world, arguably, and you can be competitive and it's like this, it ignites like, the curiosity of can I do it while also having that competitive element. And I think those two things create a really interesting formula. So, you know, that's just like the sports growth. And of course, with that growth, it creates opportunities to build businesses. You know, your specific question about trail running media. I mean, I think this is definitely something that's seeing a lot of evolution growth now too and uh, you know when i came up in the sport i devoured things like ultra running magazine i run far.com trail runner magazine ultra runner podcast etc and uh, most of i mean all those still exist and are still very important to the global trail running ecosystem and i think what we realize is like well we could sort of speak to this this new generation and to the future of the sport, you know, because of our positioning and because of my personal experience and when I came into the sport and where I am in my personal like athletic career and things like that, sort of moving towards the end of my prime years, at least as a competitor and now thinking about what's next and really wanting to like be the bridge between the old school and the new school. That's kind of what we're trying to do, you know, make sure that we all adhere to the spirit and values of trail running. And with free trail, our hashtag, our tagline for everything is trail culture, right? Like everything that's sacred to us, you know, winning, losing, training, et cetera, super important. But at the end of the day, it's the culture that matters. And so again, we want to try and be that bridge between the old school and being totally, um, you know, loyal to and never compromising the spirit, values, and culture of the sport, but also like, okay, we are moving into the future. Like, how can we do this in the right way? How can we set up the pro athletes to make a great living? How can we make sure the brands are successful? How do we create a, like an entire ecosystem where people can survive and thrive, both as athletes, as age groupers, as participants front middle back of the pack and then you know coaches body workers nutritionists media people and so that's kind of you know the 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 thing that i can't stop thinking about is like okay free trail i mean the name i'm really going long-winded here but the name is signifies sort of us trying to be on that leading edge of the next generation so if you look at free skiing free climbing free diving those were always like the progressive futuristic waves of existing sports, right? And so free trail, that's sort of like our personal designation of like, okay, this is what we're trying to do. Build a bridge between the old school, and the new school, make sure we maintain the spirit, love, culture of the sport. And then, you know, 10 years from now, there'll be another person to bridge to, to the next generation or another media entity to, to sort of pick up the torch. And, you know, that's, that's kind of the vision. I love it. I love it. And whenever I'm speaking to someone like you who's involved in the media side of things or who's also just sort of riding a bigger wave within the running world, I love asking, how do we grow the sport? You know, this is like one of my huge, broad, loaded questions that you can take in a thousand different ways. Um, and, and, and I think it's particularly interesting in this scenario because 
it, it you are in this niche within a niche, this trail running world that is experiencing this massive growth. And it would be a shame if we didn't leverage that growth to grow the sport, to bring more people into it, to grow the pie for everyone, to really get people hooked on what I think is really amazing. Like I'm like you, I love trail running, even though I'm, I'm not into hundred milers. Like I could just yeah. be on the trails all day, every day. And, and I want to share that with others. So even though this is a completely loaded, broad question that we could probably do an entire episode on, how can we leverage this to grow the sport? See, I, I don't think this is going to be a problem. Like, I honestly think the harder thing is going to be to manage the continued growth. I really do think if you ever watch the broadcast of UTMB, it's like the coolest sports broadcast that exists. It is so incredible what they do. And you have, like I said, not only the amazing human stories, for example, you know, Courtney DeWalter, Killian Jornet, Francois Den, they're just like the greatest champions athletes across any sporting discipline, I would argue. And they have this super compelling human element to them that they're approachable, they've got families, they're just normal, humble mountain people, right? And so simultaneously you pair that story with the beautiful vistas and it's just like it creates just a it sells itself and so <laughs> i mean my, my answer would be that okay this live streaming thing is gonna happen it's gonna continue to get to build steam and honestly i think that if you want your race to be relevant in 10 years from now you're gonna have to have sort of like a live broadcast of your race and that, by relevant i mean like on the competitive edge where there's gonna be like an audience of people who are interested in watching. Obviously, there's always going to be the great grassroots races to where you can just go out, enjoy it, et cetera, and the competitive aspect isn't as important. But as that is going to happen, that broadcast thing, and as that happens, this growth curve is only going to continue to go up. And so, you know, I think for me, the answer to your question is more like, how do we, how do we manage that growth curve in a way that does lead to a rising tide lifting all boats and to where we can maintain the spirit values and culture of the sport because that's what makes trail running different and that's what makes it special you know like at the end of the day you could go do a triathlon that takes 20 hours also but trail running it's the community and the feeling you get with the people who you go spend time with out on the trails that's what makes trail running different. And so, you know, if it would be a shame if as this growth continues in up and to the right, as it has been for the last decade, if we did lose track of that fundamental sacredness. So, you know, I think there's the live streaming thing is going to be the linchpin of all this, I think, because the broadcast will get better. Eventually, it'll get picked up by somebody like NBC Sports or, you know, like Netflix will make a documentary about UTMB or Western States or something, and um, it'll attract an, another new audience. And, and when those people come in, it's up to us to then be like, hey, this is what it's about. Welcome to the sport. You're our friend, but you have to take this seriously, and you cannot do things that are contrary to this spirit and this culture. So roundabout way of saying that the growth is going to happen no matter what. It's coming. Let's talk a little bit about live streaming because I, I'm interested in hearing more about why you think it's the linchpin. And maybe you can give some listeners an idea of what does live streaming look like today and what could it look like in five years from now? So, and this goes back to your question about ultras versus trail. So, I mean, I, I'm of the opinion that the real big opportunity is to broadcast some of the shorter races, because then you open up a very different audience of people who would otherwise sign up for the Houston half marathon. Now they're like, wait, I can go run a 25 K on trails instead. As you know, 
participation numbers in half marathons around the U.S. and around the world are humongous compared to trail running, right? And so, like, I just think that there's a massive opportunity for that type of a broadcast. So, but also, as you'll, for or anybody who has ever watched a trail running broadcast, you know that it can be challenging and difficult. They're in remote areas, and therefore... You kind of have to tolerate some shaky cameras. Sometimes you lose connection, et cetera. But when it's done well, it's incredibly compelling and it's only getting better. So I've done commentary for UTMB for like the last, I don't know, six, seven years or something. I remember the first year I did it, they just had a, a stationary live cam positioned at the top of the last climb at the La Fougere. And we were just like doing our commentary thing, just like looking at a still camera pointed at the mountains, right? Not that compelling. Now they have dudes running with the lead men and women with GoPros on. They have e-bikes out there and you have like a live shot of the best athletes in the world shredding through these like technical cool trails with beautiful vistas around them. And again, that just sells itself. That being said, UTMB takes the men's champion 20 hours to get through it right there's not a lot of i mean on a global scale there's the lunatic fringe of us who will literally watch almost the entire thing and but you know for a mass market audience that's where i think the short course stuff gets really interesting so for example there's a race outfit called the cirque series which does a lot of events in the summer around the mountain west and it's usually just like an up down type race like a steep climb to the summit and then a fast one down that's the type of thing where i could see like okay that could be an hour two hour broadcast that's the type of thing that would like fit in with the x games or something like that you know or like be something that some major television distrib distribution company would want to carry right and then i think that becomes really interesting too because obviously prize money would follow then you can make a compelling argument to people who are otherwise focused on road and track professionals i mean say hey why don't you try this freaking hour-long mountain race and see if you can win some money or etc and then you have sort of again another new audience finding the sport so there's a, a lot to be bullish about when it comes to broadcasting uh, and, you know, free trail. We, we try and see where we think about how we might be able to have an impact on that stuff. I do a lot of the commentary stuff, but the technical stuff is over my head. So we haven't really dipped our toe in that water yet, but it may be something that we get into more in the future. I think it's really interesting to think about the potential of short races to be captivating for a broader audience. And and I think too, if you are putting on short races like 5K, 8K, 10K, 12K, 15K, whatever, you also might be drawing in certain uh, younger people who who even might be your high school cross country athlete who's doing an off season race you know, I did a couple of these when I was in high school and college, and and I would have jumped into some of these fun trail races if they had been available. Is there any weight to the idea that allowing younger people to experience trail running with these shorter races is almost like a gateway to getting them hooked on trail running at a younger age? No question about it. And I think just also... Again, my son is only five and a half months old, so you would know better than I. But I think this the younger generation, obviously, is growing up in such a different world than you and I did. I'll, I'm turning 37 in March, so you and I are about the same age. And when I was a kid, man, I spent all day outside. And I just feel like the this new generation, life is so easy to just spend on screens. And you can get so much like you know, at least artificial joy and dopamine rushes from just like being on computers and being on screens. And granted, there's been a lot of value of things that have been developed in the technological arena that uh, are great for the world, but there's no substitute for just going out and being outside and being in nature. And I think the more we can encourage the younger generations to do that, especially as the world gets even more technological, the better off they're going to be long-term in their lives. So, I mean, I would love to, if we could help encourage 
a younger crop of people, especially, uh, and I totally, you know, uh, see the potential danger of younger people trying to get into 100 mile mountain races, for example. But yeah, there's no reason why a 14 year old can't go out and run a, a sweet trail 10K, right? And I think there's, it, it would open up. I mean, it would just bring not only a lot of great physical satisfaction, but just the emotional, psychological benefits of just being outside in nature, which are well documented. I think the kids need that. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, I will never forget halfway through my college running career, we had uh, a guy that was one year older than me. And between the end of school one year and the beginning of school the next year, over that summer, he went and explored all of the conservation land in my town. I grew up in a suburb outside of Boston, Massachusetts. And for the next two years, we pretty much did all of our easy runs on trails instead of on the roads. And this was a very different approach to our running from the first two years of my high school career. And it made a marked difference on our enjoyment of the sport, like having fun out on our distance runs every day. And if, if you had like told me that, oh, just doing the same 45 minute run, but instead of just being out on the roads, we're now going to do 80% of it out on the trail. If you had told me that that was going to make any kind of difference, I probably wouldn't have believed you. But mm -hmm. being out there in nature and just exploring the woods, the trails, the hills, the different turns and all these new areas that I had never explored before was so fulfilling. And I yeah. think it's that act of exploration that is just so fun. It's so true. And like I said, I grew up in Boulder and I remember my dad taking my brother and I out for hikes when we were call it like eight to 10 years old. And we just thought, oh, this is boring. This is lame going out and walking around with your dad in the woods. Like how <laughs> stupid. And now looking back, it's like, wow, what great memories. And like, wow. I mean, now this is my freaking life and I can't wait to do it with my son. Anyway, and now yeah. Dylan, I'm bringing my kids on hikes that they don't want to go on, but I <laughs> hope they will look back on and appreciate. Yeah. You'll thank me one day, kiddos. Yeah, man. I, I, I really think it's so important for for everyone, really. I know we're talking about kids, but I think everyone just to have that experience with nature and trail running can be such a powerful, almost gateway drug to to getting in there and, and really experiencing more of it. Um, what What is it about trail running that that is so special? Because, you know, I've been involved in road racing. I've been involved in cross country, indoor track, outdoor track my entire life. But there's something magic about trail racing. It is different. Is, yeah. it, is it the community? Is it the people? Is it the vibes? What's going on there? It's a mix of all those things. But just this morning, again, I went on about a 90-minute run with a friend here in Marin. We went to the top of a place called Big Rock Ridge. It's about a 2,400-foot climb to get up there. We started at 730, so it wasn't exactly a dawn patrol, but early-ish morning that we got to the top at a little after 8 a.m. And it's just like, we didn't see anybody out there and you just are alone at the top of this beautiful peak. This is, we can see the Pacific Ocean, can see San Francisco Bay. You can see the beautiful city of San Francisco off in the distance. You can look up to Sonoma and Napa. And it's just like, what a way to start your day. Like, is there anything <laughs> better than this? Like, oh my God, this is therapy. This is religion. This is beautiful. And you get to, like, connecting with a person. We chatted the whole time about life and career and family and business and relationships. And it's just like, man, what a way to start a day, you know? And then when you, you actually get together at a race or whatever, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful feeling. It's a celebration of achievement, of hard work. There's wins and failure. And it's so human is the thing, you know? And I think that's what, why people like me and people who come into the sport, like it becomes really easy to devote your life to it. It's like, why would I do anything else? This is the thing. This is the thing, at least for me and for my personality, like these are my people. This is my sport. This is what I want to do. So if I, I don't know if that conveys why, why trail running special, but for, for me and for a lot of people, again, it's like, it's more than just sport. It's, it's everything, you know, it's 
our relationships, it, our families become intertwined with the community. You know, my I carried my son across a finish line already when he was like <laughs> seven weeks old in Spain. It's like, gosh, this is this is the life. Yeah, when you're getting up to summits at eight o'clock in the morning, I mean, you realize Folgers does not have a monopoly on the best part of waking up. <laughs> exactly. No well, Dylan, what's what's new for you this year? What's coming down the pipeline for you and for Free Trail in 2023? So hopefully I can get back to competing myself. Uh, again, like my friend said, it's very difficult to be a good dad, a good business owner, and a good athlete all at the same time. But I would really like to try. And to this point, obviously, I've had like there's only one of those three things that I can sacrifice and that's my running and I have been sacrificing it. And uh, the last two weeks have been what I've been calling operation, get your bleep together. I don't know if I should swear on your show. Zone. It's okay. If you want to, <laughs> <laughs> which is basically like, okay, Devo, just stop making excuses, make the time to run, you know, whatever it takes, make the time to get your runs in because uh, like we talked about earlier, that's when I feel my best. And so I've had at least two and a half weeks of good discipline there and hoping to keep that momentum going. In an ideal world, my plan is to run the Ultra Trail Mount Fuji in Japan at the end of April. That's a 100-mile race around Mount Fuji, which I've done twice in the past, one of my favorite races in the world. And then I'm sixth on the wait list for the Hard Rock 100 in July in Colorado. Again, I grew up in Colorado. I have one finish there, one of the highlights of my life and my career. So I'm excited to hopefully get back in there and do hard rock again. And then the crazy idea that I have is, well, if I do those two hundreds, maybe there's a chance I would jump into UTMB at the end of the summer too. I've never done 300 milers in a season. And because I'm coming off of a year where I really didn't race very much and because I have this itch to get back to it, maybe I'll just do a 100-mile binge season. Um, so that that's kind of what I'm thinking about athletically. And then, you know, professionally with Free Trail, my hope is that we can arrive at the end of 2023 feeling like we have a path forward you know because at this point we we genuinely haven't figured out our business model and you know i don't pay myself from it and i don't know if a lot of people really understand that and simultaneously i've sunk a huge percentage of my life savings into it and so it's like all right i really need this to work and needs to work this year otherwise you know we'll have to reevaluate some stuff i mean i love 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 free trail and everything that we're doing and you know more than making money off of it i really just want to be a service to the community and and deliver something that the sport deserves but at the end of the day yeah i do need to sort of figure out the fundamentals of how to make it my life's work and so that's that's kind of like the main focus professionally of 2023 and of course my son is growing up so obviously a lot of fun family stuff mixed in there too. So life is rich, life is complicated, life is fun, and I'm experiencing all those things right now. That's amazing, Dylan. And it's been really cool to see the growth of Free Trail over the last two years or so. And you know that we're all rooting for you. I think you're doing something really special in the trail running space, a space that I can tell has some real magic and growth to it. So it's going to be really cool to see what you guys do this year in 2023. And um, I, I will just say, too, as well, as a dad who has put their running on the back burner for quite a while, because you're, you're absolutely right. You can't be a good small business owner and a good dad and everything else in your life at the same time. I'm starting to get back into it now, too. And I've had just a couple runs where I've started to feel like my old self. And it is an intoxicating feeling. It is just amazing. Oh, and, and I'm desperate for that feeling, man. I'm desperate. It's a good one. It's a yeah. great feeling. And and I I really haven't trained very well for a while, a long time, like maybe seven years or so. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really looking forward to getting back into it, starting to run much more consistently. Uh, and you're right. It makes you feel better. It gives you a better 
anchor to your day. So uh, I'm going to be cheering for you to get back into it. And I hope you have uh, an amazing three 100 miler season. Yeah, we'll see. Well, yeah, thanks so much, Jason. I really appreciate you having me on the show. And I'm glad we're, we're both recommitting to our running at the same time. So maybe, maybe we could, I'll have you on my show. We'll revisit where we are in a few months and see if we've been able to <laughs> recommit ourselves. And then the audience will be kept informed about our eight, the two aging dads. Uh, <laughs> to well, now we've said it publicly, so there's yeah. no going back. Let's That's the ultimate that. commitment. Well, thanks, Dylan. I appreciate your time today. Thanks, Jason.